Hi, and welcome to episode number four of Poker with GPA. I am GPA, and I'm psyched today to have on as a guest Jeff Platt, a broadcaster for Poker Go Television. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. How you doing? I am doing well. I am psyched about Poker Go. I love Poker Go. I'm, nice. I'm addicted. Thank you. I'm addicted. And we'll definitely talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about your. Uh, how you got into poker and everything. I know that you started as a uh, reporter for uh, NBA basketball mm -hmm. for the, for the Spurs and for the Mavericks. How, how was that? Cause I'm, I'm a huge basketball fan. So how, how was that? It was great. It was great. You know, I'm a huge basketball fan as well. I'm with you on being a hoops nerd, a hoops junkie. So whenever you can get into the arena and it's quote unquote work, I mean, that's, that's the dream right there. When you can talk to the players, when you can talk to the coaches and it's considered your job, it's, it's hard to ask for, for anything more. So I loved every minute of it. Just once, once I thought an opportunity could come about in the, the poker world, the poker landscape, but broadcasting is one passion of mine. Poker is another. So I figured, you know, why don't we merge these two together and let's try to try to make some magic happen. And I've been uh, very lucky and, and very fortunate to, to get into a couple of opportunities over these last couple of years. And before we get talking about how, how you got into poker, I want to go back to basketball just for one quick question. Sure. How was Mark Cuban, the owner of the Mets? How was he to deal with? Uh, Q's great. He's, he's great. He's awesome. I mean, I'm biased because I'm a diehard Mavericks fan. Mm -hmm. So I've always loved Mark Cuban even before I got to covering him as a media member. So I, I really appreciate his open accessibility to, to all media members. You know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't just sit down for an interview with ESPN, but he'd sit down with like an online Mavs blog, you know, once a month, just to give them the, the, the time that he thought they deserved for putting in hard work. I'm not sure if you're able to find a more passionate owner in sports. So to be able to have that owner be a part of my team, uh, I'm, I'm selfish, but, but I absolutely love it. Yeah. As as a, Celt as a Celtics fan, I would love to see the Celtics and Mavericks play in the finals sometime. That'd be That'd fine be with me. I just, damn, I, you know, I, I just want to get to the finals. So, you know, <laughs> if, the, if it's the Celtics awaiting or the Heat again or whoever, I, I just want the Luka and the Mavs to get there. And I know you guys have a couple of, uh, of young studs, to stay, say the least, in, in Jalen Brown and, and Jason Tatum. So I, I think that's – I think there's some potential in that matchup as we move ahead a couple years. Maybe not this year. But maybe right. in the years ahead. I don't think the Celtics are ready either. Let's, let's talk a little bit about how did, you, how did you find the game of poker? How did you start out playing poker and then wanting to work in, the, in that um, work in a poker atmosphere? Well, playing, it's probably that cliche story, Jamie, that you've heard so many times. Uh, I came up in poker during the, the moneymaker boom. So when I was in high school, my friends and I would watch the 2003 World Series of Poker main event on ESPN. And then we would play our little $20 cash game or $20 sit and go. And I feel like four or five of us just became hooked on the game at the same time, especially my best friend and I. And we developed this passion. We developed this love. We would play live. We would play online, even for just a couple bucks. We just uh, thrived off the, the competition element of it. So that's how I got into playing. I kept up playing. I would always try to come to Vegas once every summer to take my big shots, even when I was working in, in sports broadcasting. I had kept in touch with a couple members of what was formerly Poker Productions, which is now a part of Poker Go, led by Maury Eskandani with executive producer Dan Gotti. I was fortunate enough to grab an opportunity to come audition for them. And, you know, we got along really well. We clicked. I kind of came out here with nothing promised to me, but with a lot of potential that I saw. And again, I said this, you know, just a couple minutes ago, but I've been fortunate to work my way into into a couple of opportunities and here we are and that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty gutsy to make that move where nothing's been promised to you where yeah. there's a lot of potential but they, there could be a lot of potential that goes away so you've been uh, very lucky and, and you're one of the uh from i talk to a lot of people that watch poker like poker you're one of the people that people like to see covering you know matches or you know be it you know whatever whatever poker go has on for that day i know that you and you and uh, brent hanks have been very busy this week you know covering oh yeah oh yeah I, i've got the I've got the alarm set for uh, 2.15 a.m. tomorrow. We're, we're in work by 3. We're prepping for an hour, and we are on the air at 4 a.m. Pacific time for Super High Roller Series Europe. But again, it's just one of those spots. 
doesn't really feel like work. Like, sure, I got to get there early. So that part feels a little work-like. Um, but, you know, Brent and I just love this. We love talking about poker. We love covering poker. And we're, we're really good friends. We get along really well. So I just get to go in with my buddy and, and call a poker tournament with some of the best in the world, you know. I think there are tougher jobs out there. I'm not quite sure, and, but I would just assume so. And you and Brent definitely work well together. I mean, one one thing I like, and I hope that, they, I'm not sure if it's going, I hope they bring it back, but no gamble, no future. I hope yeah, that thank comes you. Back. I mean, I like that. So That was so much fun with, with your uncle on, the one of the, I forget his name, but uncle. Um, uncle Ron. Uncle Ron. And then with Brent's, you know, cousin being on. I, that, that was a great, that's a great show. Well, thank you for saying that. We needed to take a break uh, in this month and towards the end of July, but we'll be back at the beginning of a football season with, with some cool uh, new plans, with some new segments, with some new clips, and we'll be available on podcast channels as well, not just our YouTube channel. So we have big plans for season two of that show. So thank you for the kind words. You know, we wanted to put together a show that incorporated not only sports betting, not only daily fantasy sports, not only regular fantasy sports, but, but poker as well, because there are a million sports betting shows and probably by now a million poker shows, but none that really do both. And that's what we're, that's what we're going for. Well, another asset that you guys have too, is you guys have the connection to get so many different guests to go on. They'd be at Phil Helmuth or Daniel Negreanu or any, anybody that's in the poker world. You guys have, you know, they're you call, call them right up and they'll be right over for you guys. And that's awesome to watch as well. We are very fortunate to have quite the Rolodex, and I give Brent complete credit for that. He's director of programming for PokerGo, so he's got this real job on the side, and that involves him getting to know all of these big-time poker players who have just become comfortable with Brent. And so if Brent asks them to do something, they're usually down to do it. We've become great friends uh, with the Negranis, with both Daniel and Amanda, and that's something that I'm really fortunate for, become friends with Bill Helmuth. And so, you know, you get to know these guys. They're really good guys, and, and we we still cherish every moment that we're able to talk to them on air. Now, obviously, Phil Phil Helmuth, he's a character. I mean, even yesterday with, yeah. with his uh, with this matchup, first thing he does is starts eating a sandwich, and the person yeah. who ever bet with bacon won that bet. I think, believe it was three to one. True, three to one. So they won that bet. And, but who are some of the other characters on there? I know that in a way Daniel is, but he's a little bit more setback. But there are characters, old and new players, of poker. Yeah, I I think. I think that poker is in a, in a really good spot right now. I, I think that that some of these young guns, while a lot of them are looked at as GTO robot, robots, they really do bring personality to tables. I, I promise you that if you sat there and you watched all Liam Shurovich at a final table, yeah. you, you'd, you'd be entertained, not just because of his style of play, but his personality. And I think a lot of the other young guys are, are following suit. You know, take a guy like, like Sean Perry. And he, yes. you know, he's, he's the star of the show and we love having him on. He can be a bit polarizing. You know, you might love Sean Perry. You might hate Sean Perry, but you're going to be entertained by Sean Perry. So I think the game's in a really great place when you combine those guys with the, the quote unquote old school guys with a Phil Helmuth or, or with a Daniel Negreanu or, or with a Phil Ivey. Well, look, you mentioned, you mentioned the old school guys. Look how well they've done re recently. Tony G. Tony G. What, right. Who I, when I was, when he first started back, I started watching probably the same time you did when, when Moneymaker had won, that's when I first got involved. Because mm -hmm. I knew nothing about the game, but I liked the characters at first, and I learned mm -hmm. about the game moving forward. But I didn't like Tony G before. I love Tony G now. I love Tony G. I think he's another guy who's just, just an absolute star. Like when when he's on camera, you're just drawn to him. Oh, he's, he's just great. he's just he's just magnetic, right? And and he can he can take over a show. And like you said, maybe you know maybe he could rub you the wrong way 15 years ago or so. He's matured a little bit, but still has some trash talking left in him. Yeah. Um, still has some of his good. "I'm the best" moments. Uh, and he's he's awesome. He's a blast. He, he's a real treat to have at our, our feature tables. Yeah. And then also you've had you know Eric Seidel has won Phil Ivey and mm -hmm. Daniel Grani won uh, a tournament, big tournament at Poker Go just a little while ago. So this yeah, some of the I old mean school guys. To have Negreanu ship the, the Poker Go Cup, you know, th that is a big time series win. That, that's a big accomplishment. You know, we always say that anybody can come in and win one poker tournament. He didn't just do that. He, he won an entire series, and it's a series that featured the best of the best in the world. So you, you still have to consider Daniel Negreanu to be at the top of your list when you're, when you're talking about the best. Mm -hmm. And obviously another character that we haven't mentioned yet is uh, Mike the Mouth Master. He was my first guest on this show. And he was, wow. He, he told me he'd give me 20 minutes. He was on for an hour and five minutes. I couldn't get rid of him. I'm not surprised. But it was good though. He was so, he's such a nice guy. He, he, he doesn't give that persona all the time, but he's a really nice guy. He's a nice guy. And Mike and I have, uh, we, 
we've had our back and forth via uh, via online via a couple of streams that we've done. Sure. Uh, but my first appearance on Poker After Dark as a player, mm -hmm. he was also there, and he was really kind to me. And I always, you know, I've always respected Mike. He's had his ups and downs in his career, and he's he's admitted that. I'm sure he, he's admitted that to you. Um, but he's always been really nice to me. And that's always something that has stood with me. You know, I, I've taken issue with the way that he's treated uh, other people, other players um, at certain times. You know, we've had our little back and forth. But yeah. again, I, what will always stand out to me is how nice he was to me at Poker After Dark. Yeah, so he was good. But I, want, I do want to talk a little bit more about poker, but I also want to talk about um, other things that you've done. I mean, last year at the World Series main event, you were like the sideline reporter. Yeah, well, well how you know, cool the, was that? how cool was that? Oh, well, it was awesome. I mean, I, you know, I'm very aware that there's a long list before they get to me for World Series of Poker main event coverage. So unfortunately, Kara Scott could not make it. Unfortunately, my friend Maria Ho could not make it. And so eventually they're going to get to me on this list. And I got a call from uh, my our executive producer, Dan Gotti, who I mentioned before. And he's like, so do you want to do sideline coverage for ESPN and the world series of poker main event? I said, you know, that, that would be a yes. So I was absolutely thrilled. You know, I, I was of course nervous for, for the moment, but uh, it was an, an incredible opportunity. One that I'm so fortunate to receive, you know, that I could not go into it with saying, okay, I'm going to fill Kara Scott's shoes because those shoes are just iconic right. and it'd be unrealistic to expect uh, to be as good as Kara Scott. So I had to go into it thinking, I just got to be me. You know, I, I've just got to do my own thing. I can't try to be Kara because that's impossible because she's, I mean, she's literally the best. So I tried to go in there, do my own thing. I'm happy with the way uh, it turned out. I give our producer, Zach, uh, a lot of crap for, you know, editing me out at times of, of certain <laughs> spots, but he says he has to do it. I get it. There's time constraints for these programs, but it was, it was a, a terrific experience, one that I was very lucky to have. Are you lined up for this year working at the World Series of Poker um, at all? I'm, I'm lined up a little bit for World Series of Poker coverage. On Poker Go, we're going to stream a lot of the preliminary bracelet events. We're also going to stream the, the main event live. Now, all of these edited programs will be on CBS Sports Network later this year, right. which I think is is fantastic for poker. It's it's great exposure on CBS Sports Network. And so I will be doing some sideline reporting uh, for some of the preliminary events, but for some, so, some really big tournaments. And I think all of our main event coverage is, is to be determined. But I, I mean, I genuinely hope, and I know that Lon and Norman are back, and I genuinely yes. hope that Kara uh, is also right. back, is also able to make it to to America, make it to Vegas, because she, she shines in that role, and she's uh, somebody that I look up to. Yeah, you, you mentioned a little earlier that one person that you said um, wasn't able to do it was Maria Hall, wasn't mm -hmm. able to do it. Could, um, if you could do me a favor, if she by chance watches this video and she asks you about me, could you just let her know that I'm married? So unfortunately, it's out of the question. Sure, sure. You got it. You got it. I will absolutely. I'm sure that never happens know. to her ever. Right, 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 right. Right, right. right. She, no, never gets hit on. No, no, Absol no. Absolutely never. Maria, Maria is great. No, but um, she is great. She does a great job covering the different events as well. She, she does a fantastic job and she's really gotten into that analyst role also. And I think that's a place where, where she's really thrived. So she's incredibly versatile. She can do sideline reporting. She can do uh, break desk analyst work with Brent and me. And then she can jump in the booth with the Nalina Jean and provide what, what I consider to be uh, fantastic conversational analysis on whatever program we have on, whether it's a cash game or a tournament or it's high stakes duel. So she's the real deal. And she, she's a fantastic poker player. And uh, I think most importantly, a, a genuine human being on the side. So um, I'm grateful to call her a friend for sure. Now you mentioned that about playing and you, you've obviously played, I know I've looked it up and you did um, pretty well so far in June, you cashed quite a few times. I believe on June 27th, you cashed for $16,800 in one tournament, but you cashed, it seemed like several days in a row. How, how important is it to, to still be able to play as well as doing your job when you're report doing reporting? Um, yeah, well, I think it's important. I think the two almost go hand in hand. I mean, listen, if I study to become a better poker player, which I do try to do, that is just naturally going to make me a better poker broadcaster, right? Because not only do I understand more of the game, but I'm also able to set up my analyst, and that's usually Brent Hanks, in better spots when I know more about what is going on in these high-level tournament poker concepts. I'm nowhere near that level, 
but I'm trying to get a little bit better, a little bit more knowledgeable each and every day. That's going to help me at work and that's going to help me on the felt as well. So I'm, I'm studying and I'm looking at my range trainer pro and then I get to watch the best of the best in the world. That's another tool in studying. And then maybe I can apply some concepts in the tournaments that I play. So I think, I think everything merges, everything does indeed go hand, hand in hand. It was, it was 2014, 2015, you cashed in, in both uh, main events. What was that like, like the first time to cash in, in, in the main event? Was that the first time you had cashed? In that the was the event? first, yes. So 2014 okay. was the first main event that I had played. I had I'd run well in, a, in one of the daily deep stacks at the Rio and a family friend gave me a great staking offer and said, why don't you go play the main? I said, you know, let's do it. You can't pass up an opportunity to play the greatest poker tournament in the world. And it, it's everything you dream of. Uh, plus some, you know, I, I always say that Mavs head coach, Rick Carlisle, former Mavs head coach, Rick Carlisle said in the NBA playoffs, when you win a game, you feel on top of the world, like you're never going to lose a, a game again. When you lose a game, you're just crushed. You're devastated. You think you can never win. And I feel the same way when you play the world series of poker main event, when you win one hand, when you win a pot, you are the, the feeling of electricity that runs through your body is, is unlike anything else. And you think, Hey, this really could be me. When you lose a pot, you are devastated. And to go through that kind of emotional roller coaster for five or six days, it really, really makes that tournament something special. Because then your second year, you finished 60th, and that, that had to be quite, quite the run as well. It was wild. And my, my best friend came in from Dallas. My dad came in town. I had mm. some of my really good friends from college there. It, it was incredible. And when you get down to 60, I mean, when you walk in on day six and there are like, 70 players there yeah. so there's like nine tables there you start to think Meh, i mean this could be me it was not me that year but hopefully right. it is me in For future sure. years yeah. but it, it was unreal it was, so, it was surreal what do you what do you do like after like say day two and you're done playing for the day i mean obviously you, you want to rest up and everything but what goes through your mind during that time? It's, it's, yeah it's straining it's a great question because yeah i mean your mind is obviously racing right so even though you're exhausted it's, it's hard to turn that light switch off, but it, it's important to try because sleep is so important. And it sounds silly because like, oh, you're just sitting there playing poker, but it is so mentally draining that you need your rest. And, and for me, I tried to develop a morning routine of, you know, get up, work out, sit outside for a little bit, do some studying, which is like I do now when I'm living here in Vegas, it was a little harder for me 2014, 2015, staying at a hotel. But if I ever have the opportunity to run deep in the main event, again, it's just so important to stick to your your daily routine to get that right amount of rest in, yeah. to get that right amount of you know nutrition, fitness in. At least that's what has worked for me in the past. And let you, and let you clear your head as well to get ready for the next day. I'm sure that's important. Absolutely. You know, sometimes you just got to shut it off. I mean, it's easy to come home and see all your tweets and Facebook messages and just get so excited and keep looking at poker article after poker article after poker article. Sometimes you got to read a book, watch a TV show, check out a movie and just get your mind off of poker at least for a little bit. It kind of helps you relax, helps you calm down, helps you sleep a little bit better. So you will be playing, you will be playing this year's WSOP. You're definitely going to be playing this year's. WSOP. Yeah, I, I mean, my goal is to play. I, I want to say like seven to eight events and then hopefully the main event, you know, I'd always prefer to work the main event, but oh, yeah. uh, if I'm not working the main event, then, then I will play it every year from here uh, until the end of time, because I, I, I said it before, I'll say it again. It is the greatest poker tournament in the world and to be a, a small, small, small part of it, uh, certainly something special. So I'm really looking forward to this world series. I'm the most confident I've ever been in my game. Not that that's saying that much. I still know that there's, Plenty of work to be done, but I'm super excited about it. I think it'll be huge. And the main event has grown so much from, like you said, from when Moneymaker first won the tournament. I mean, who knew poker before that? I mean, before that happened. It was, yeah, it was there were, very... you know, it, there are 840 players the year Moneymaker won it. And, I mean, we're going to have a huge field again this year. I, I It's hard to give you a number because of, you know, COVID restrictions right. and everything right. that the WSOP still has planned. Sure. as far as uh, capacity is concerned, but it'll be huge just every single year. I'd be, I'd be shocked if one year was not absolutely massive. You'll have to wait and see what happens with, with that. Who knows whether or not they'll be able to, hopefully they're able to have the WSOP this year. I mean, I yeah, yeah, they're, they're gone. It's, it's all systems go. I, I mean, I know I said, I'm sure I said this last year at a certain point, but we're a month away. Um, 
we're yeah, that's we're going. we're going. We're we're yeah, we're going strong. One hundred percent. We're going strong. Let's that, do this. That's good. I think one thing I like about, one of the things I like the most about poker is two shows that they brought back, and that's Poker After Dark mm-hmm. and High Stakes Poker. Mm-hmm. I think those two uh, shows right there are, are some of the keys for poker. For poker Go. Bringing those I think back. those those two shows are are absolutely iconic. They they really are. I don't think that's an understatement at all. Poker After Dark and High Stakes Poker and that those money maker episodes yeah. are what people think of when they think of poker. Uh, the casual poker fan knows Poker After Dark, knows High Stakes Poker, and knows the World Series of Poker. So to bring those shows back, I think I think was really important for Poker Go to establish the the credibility, the importance, the significance, whatever word you want to use of the brand. And I'm just absolutely thrilled that they're there. I'm excited too that they brought back Gabe Kaplan. Yeah, Gabe that, Kaplan, so absolute cool. legend. So cool. Kaplan and Benza. I mean, those guys, those guys are just the best. It just feels like they're sitting on the couch next to you calling a poker tournament. And, and that's what you what you strive for as a broadcast team. I I, I can't remember the name, but I, I remember watching the show that Gabe Kaplan was the teacher, and I can't think of the name right now. The TV show that he Is it did. Welcome back, Cotter. Welcome back, Cotter. Yeah, there we go. I watched that as a kid. I mean, that was that was just unbelievable. He's a superstar. He's an absolute yeah. superstar. Yeah. And they get do, do you the game of poker is a game. Obviously, it's on ESPN. Do you consider poker to be a sport in some in some regards? Well, in some regards, sure, but I, I don't consider it to be a sport. Like if if you if you ask me right now, yes or no, is poker a sport? I, I would have to say no because I, I think that, in, in my personal opinion, mm-hmm. that a sport requires some athletic ability. But are there elements of poker that are like sports? Absolutely. The level of competition is top notch. The level of, of mental ability that you have to have to be a good poker player is at an elite level when compared to the rest of the world. So I, I think we talked earlier about how the main event was so draining and, and so grueling. That's a lot like sports also. So, so sure, there are certain elements of it that represent the competition of sports. I just don't consider it an actual sport. And that, that's not a knock against poker i would say the same thing about chess and i i i absolutely adore chess i, I think it's fantastic have you ever played against um Negrino chess no i i mean when i state my interest in chess okay. let me say that it goes to <laughs> watching queen's gambit all right uh appreciating chess for what it is haven't dove mm-hmm. into it i know negrani plays i got to know uh the great alexandra botez a little bit um she plays chess so she's a big time twitch streamer She's awesome. I'm just, I'm, I'm fascinated by the game. I just have not learned the game yet. Okay. Poker's, you know, poker's too hard. Poker takes up, sure. you know, every free minute I have, I want to just try to study poker. I, I, I can understand that. I can respect that. But you talk about poker and talk about other games. Well, a lot of people start with other games. They start playing chess or they start yeah. doing the video games and then they go to poker. I, I was talking with Alexandra about that the other day. We shot a Poker After Dark episode with her in Sure, it's a cliche question like, oh, what skills transfer over from your sport to ours, that kind of thing. But there's something to be said for that. I mean, for, again, the competition, for, you know, the mental note taking that you have to go through when you're in a match, the one on one element of chess, reading your opponent and you do the exact same thing in poker. It's it's similar. It's comparable and it's understandable why people jump into poker after competing in either other sports or other games. Do you think I'll let you go after two, two more questions. Do you think that Helmut, okay, okay. do you think that Helmut is going to um, challenge Dwan and play against Dwan? heads up? You know, I mean, he only has, I think 72 hours to, oh, to oh, respond. Okay. And, and my best guess as of now is no, that he will not, uh,
rematch Tom Dwan. 200K for Helmuth is pretty pricey. Listen, the guy's doing fine financially. Trust me on that. Yeah, just yeah. ask him if you he's want to know just, more. Just watch, just watch his, all the things he promotes. Yeah, and trust and, he, and he's, he's doing show. fine. But with that, he's fairly tight, fairly conservative with his money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Smart. Probably a lot of, yeah. yeah, a lot of poker players could take note. And while he could get the backing for it, I, I just think, you know, he, he probably realizes he's a bit of an underdog against Dwan. And I think he's, He's probably content with it's going seven, seven and one. And one. Uh, it's it's unbelievable. Five percent. That's that's yeah, pretty good. <laughs> he swept his Fandiari. He swept Negranu, and I, I think he can you know kind of bow out of this competition. So my best guess would be no. He he does not fire off on the rematch. All right. What would if you had a heads up matchup against against uh, your buddy Brent Hanks? Who would win? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, let me say this. Just like Daniel Negreanu was favored against Phil Hellmuth, mm -hmm. Brent Hanks would be favored against me, but I would find a way. I would find a way to win. That's what I'll give you. I, I like that. And one line, when, during the um, like the heads-up matchups, other matchups, does the dealer have a, a card um, shift machine next to them? Because I never see them shuffle the cards, but I see them put them down and grab another deck. Yes, they do. They do. They have a card shuffler that's right next shuffler. to them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at, at least at Poker Go Studio, it's right next to yeah. them. You know, they're in different places across the no, world. I was just talking about that. Yeah. About uh, Poker Go. I was just curious. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We in our studios, yes. There are, there are chip shufflers everywhere. You know, max efficiency right, right, yeah. at the just, Poker Go Studio. Right, right. It doesn't. It's yeah. not the prettiest machine in the world, so they, they don't want no. to put it on camera. So, yeah, I, they do a good job of hiding it. Where I play, I live in Massachusetts. Where we don't have any poker right now so you have to go to new hampshire i live two minutes from the border to go to new hampshire and they have their uh shufflers right built into the uh table oh perfect perfect so that's yeah. easy oh, yeah. that's easy we're just able to to hide hide ours while making it easily accessible for our dealers sure, sure. it was kind of a useless question but it's one i was curious about myself yeah there, trust me there, there are no there are no bad questions no bad at questions, least i hope sure. not yeah so, so what's up for jeff platt next well, we're going to continue Super High Roller Series Europe. That culminates with the Super High Roller Bowl Europe. That's a $250,000 buy-in. That starts on wow. Monday. We go from that basically right into Poker Masters in September at the Poker Go Studio, which is one of my favorite series of the year. It brings out the best of the best. And then it's Super High Roller Bowl 6. That's a $300,000 buy-in. Hopefully, we'll be involved in the coverage with that. Then we have World Series of Poker, like we discussed. And then in December, we're going to wrap things up with the Poker Go Tour Championship. Details to come on that one. But I'm really excited. I mean, these next uh, three months, all the way up until Thanksgiving, they're, they're jam-packed, and, and I couldn't be more fired up. Well, you are busy. I will say that. And I Very busy. Yes, I want to appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. And you got to go home real quick and go to bed because it's going to be time for you to get up pretty soon and cover the uh, tournaments in Europe. That much is true, but happy to do it and happy to be here. And thank you so much for having me. And, and we genuinely uh, appreciate the kind words. All right. Thank you so much. That's Jeff Platt from Poker Go. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you next time on Poker with G-Pot. See you later. Have a great day.